really don't want to use the microphone. Um, I, I also don't have any slides. I'm not a big believer in, in PowerPoint. So you can stare at the screen as much as you want. It's not going to change. Um, and, and the other thing I just kind of wanted to mention is, as I'm not a you know, college lecturer or uh, a priest doing a sermon, um, if you have a question, you can just ask while I'm talking. You don't have to wait until the end. That's, that's fine. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit today um, about the use of AI in finance and give some use cases uh, that we've been working on. To give you a little bit of a background, I've actually been working in the AI space since 1980. And I started working in uh, speech recognition and, and natural language processing, and then kind of went through uh, expert systems, uh, neural nets v1, and case-based reasoning. And then I worked on neural nets v2. We're currently at neural nets v3, which is deep learning. Um, and, and a lot of the work that I've done has been in areas around um, measurement of risk in finance. And one of the things that I, I did a few years ago was I was doing some work in the UK and I came back and I co-founded a company that was a marketplace um, for um, equipment leasing. And uh, it wasn't terribly interesting, uh, but after a few years, I was able to sell my shares in it and had a little bit of you know, money lying around. And that gave me some breeding room and that I didn't need to figure out what I was going to do next for a little while. And I started working on kind of some interesting problems. And one of the problems that I found that was very interesting is um, prostate cancer diagnosis. Because um, of all the major forms of cancer diagnosis, it's the one with the lowest accuracy rate when human beings attempt to diagnose it. Um, skilled pathologists have about a 70% accuracy rate in, in diagnosing prostate cancer. And I had this idea, well, what if I looked at the, um, the, an RNA microarray, which gave me the gene expression values for all the genes in the sample? Um, could I run that through a machine learning algorithm and predict the likelihood of cancer nearby, not cancer in the cell? you know, sample. Um, and in order to do that, what I discovered is, well, there aren't really any very many algorithms at the time that you can feed a vector of 25,000 values into. So the big problem was, well, how do you deal with these kind of very, very wide and very shallow data sets? Because a typical cancer study has about 20 cases in it, um, but it has 25,000 inputs, right? Serious problem. When you look at proteins, the, the vector for proteins grows to 465,000. I can't currently do that. I can do the 25,000. Um, but so when I built those models, I found that we could accurately predict cancer outcome with samples of healthy tissue. We could tell whether someone had cancer somewhere else in the prostate with a 98% accuracy. Um, but when I looked at monetizing that, I realized, well, in the US at least, it takes about seven years and $100 million to get started with an FDA approval. So I started looking at, well, what else could we apply this algorithm to um, that we could monetize? And uh, because I'd worked a lot in credit and finance, it was just kind of natural. Well, let's try this same approach. Instead of genomics, let's try it on subprime credit. And I found that, lo and behold, the same algorithm works. Um, and we'd already solved for 25,000 attributes. So since we were, didn't need to look at more than 3,000 attributes in credit, the hard problem was, was solved. Uh, so I implemented um, you know, a, a beta test with a lender in the States. And they were a um, deep subprime lender. They, they lent between $300 and $1,000 for six to 10 months, very high interest rates, what used to be called payday lenders. Right? Um, very, very high default rates. So their big problem was they had 32.8%, um, no, I'm sorry, 38.2% first payment default rate. So, 38% of their loans never made the first payment back. When you're charging like 700% interest, 
okay, you know. Um, but they weren't making money. And so we took their bureau best practice model, which was based on logistic regression and primarily used credit uh, a credit score. Um, and we replaced it with um, a machine learning based model that instead of looking at four attributes, which is uh, FICO score, debt to income ratio, trade lines, and inquiry counts, we looked at over 2,000. And that model, when we just put it in initially, derived a, uh, uh, an FPD of 22%. So in the first month, we went from 38.2 to 22%. Um, but by making the model dynamic, and every time someone paid or didn't pay a loan, injecting that in the model and retraining it, it went from 22 to 18 the next month then from 18 to 15, then from 15 to 12, and then from 12 to 9, and eventually 7.8. One of the things that you have to be careful about in doing this sort of thing is it's very easy to derive a 0% default rate, just don't lose, lend money out, right? So you can over-optimize the model to where you reduce the profitability of the portfolio. So while we were doing this, we were measuring how much profit was derived from the portfolio. And what we discovered was 7.8% FPD is over-optimized because it reduces the yield on the portfolio. 9% in their particular case is the sweet spot. But you now have the mathematical levers to simply say, oh, we're just going to go you know, from 7.8 to 9 and lock in 9. And that's transformative to the business. Uh, and we just ran like that, locked in at nine for two and a half years. Um, and that's where they are today. So um, that's a case where you can replace the traditional uh, logistic regression methodology with something much more powerful. And the key to it is this. When you deal with the credit universe, and this is what we're, we're doing specifically at, at TUA, um, the traditional methodology of rating credit and determining risk, uh, which is to apply logistic regression primarily with FICO scores, um, that actually works. It works for the section of the cohort that is at FICO 700 and above, which is why banks lend to people at FICO 700 and above. It's not because they like them better. It's because they understand the risk profile of that population. Inherently, uh, consumer credit, like weather, is a nonlinear problem. But like most complex nonlinear problems, there's a portion of it that's linearly addressable. And that's what kind of makes the problem deceptive. Because you can accurately predict weather for three days you can't accurately predict weather for six months. It's too chaotic and nonlinear. Credit is the same way. You can accurately predict FICO 700 and above using the traditional methodologies. If you want to accurately predict as you move away from FICO 700, you have to use more data and nonlinear models. When you get to people who have no FICO scores, right? The traditional financial institution just says, you don't have a score. You can't borrow from us. We made an interesting discovery in auditing lenders. We found a lender that was testing into their unscored population. And so basically, everyone who didn't have a FICO score, whose identity they validated, they loaned to. This lender overall had a 10% charge off rate. Right? Um, their most expensive loans charged off at 24%. Okay? Pretty typical. The population of unscored people charged off at 14%. So 4% more than the average of people with FICO scores. And so the, the lesson to the lender was, you know, if you simply took all those people who didn't have scores and you gave them your most expensive loan, they would outperform all the people you're loaning to at your most expensive rate. Um, that, to me, is one of the most important 
findings that we've seen because the fact that people don't have credit scores does not make them high risk. It makes them a known risk. And if you can look at data, like we're looking at utility payments, um, rental payments, um, cell phone payments, you know, you, you can look at all kinds of things that are outside the traditional credit spectrum and get a good idea of risk. So what we're doing at TUO right now is building up the sufficient level of data to where we have an understanding of the Canadian market that when somebody who's never been approved for a credit card or a bank loan comes to us, we have an understanding of what we can look at and accurately determine the risk of loaning to them. From a technical perspective, you know, when, when we're looking at you know, something like a Kaggle competition, um, we're really simplifying the problem. Um, you have a credit file, and the credit file has a lot of data in it. And you extract the data, and you create a vector out of it. So what we're trying to do is simply establish a correlation between the vector that's input and a dependent variable. So the dependent variable is, in machine learning terms, classification. This is a classification problem. Can we determine what loans are good or bad? Right? But that doesn't help you with pricing. But the probability that a loan is good or bad tells you how to price it. Because a loan that has a 92% probability of being profitable is worth more than a loan that has an 82% probability of being profitable. So in essence, all the problems become classification problems. And what you're really measuring is a binary outcome, but what is the probability of the binary outcome? Um, another example that where we're using uh, AI at, um, at TUA is using deep learning to validate ID. So when we ask somebody for an ID, we want them to take a picture of their driver's license. And we want them to take a picture of themselves. And then we use a deep learning algorithm to determine the probability that the person in the ID and the person in the selfie are the same, even though they may have grown a beard and, worn, and, and started wearing glasses. Um, the, the algorithm is going to tell us what is the confidence that this person is the same person. Um, the next step is how confident are we that the, that the information typed on the ID is also the information entered into the application. So that's another thing that deep learning allows us to do. The traditional methodology is to create um, a template of a driver's license and say, okay, well, here's the, we center the driver's license and the name is over in this block and we do OCR on it, right? The problem with that is what happens when people aren't very good at taking the picture of the license, right? And it's, it's angled and it's tilted and suddenly the template doesn't work very well. Um, deep learning is much more forgiving of that type of problem um, than um, a, a templated uh, approach. And we also use a tool called um, Hello Vera, uh, which we didn't write internally, which is uh, an AI-based uh, bot uh, to provide support. And the, the idea is, and I'm sure you've seen these a million times, you know, you, you type in a question and generally it says somebody's gonna get back with you tomorrow. Um, the idea of Hello Vera is can we derive the, an understanding of the question and can we provide an answer so they don't have to wait until tomorrow? Very much uh, a work in, in progress. You know, the technology is not quite there yet, but, but the guy who created Hello Vera was one of the lead designers on uh, IBM's Watson. So um, I think they're going to get there. Yeah. So that's kind of an example of some of the things um, that we're working on. Um, in terms of you know, what we were watching here, and I will say in, in, in feature engineering, um, it's kind of interesting because when you look at this, the analysis that was being done, which was, was very well uh, presented, you realize that this is stuff that computers are really good at and people aren't. 
And there's some guys in California who kind of figured that out, you know, at h2o.ai. And what they did was they hired a bunch of uh, Kaggle grandmasters, and they started recreating their process in software. And so h2o.ai gives you an interface that basically you feed the data in, and it does all the feature engineering, um, and does the testing, and builds the ensemble, and gives you the results. And I think that that's really the future of this type of work is leveraging much greater automation to perform the AI tasks. Um, the other thing, how are we on time? Oh, sorry, go ahead. So in terms of finance, uh, what other aspects of finance that is, uh, like AI is using algorithmic trading? What do you think about algorithmic trading? I'm not hearing what? Uh, do you think AI could be used in algorithmic trading? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, it, it is. I mean, the basis of algorithmic trading is essentially machine learning algorithms, although many of them are based on linear models. But there's no reason why you, you can't apply it, you know, to, to use uh, a nonlinear model. I'd say that the first large examples of AI in finance is algorithmic trading of equities and um, uh, fixed income assets. And you still see that going on. Yeah. Um, generally, when you do ID verification, you do some form of liveness testing as, as well. So, for instance, you give a task to the person, and that prevents the use of a static photo. Um, also, if you if the photos match, right, you know, it's, it's going to generate a 100% confidence, and we're not going to buy into 100% confidence because it's not going to happen. Yeah, the, generally, liveness is uh, you ask a person to turn to the left and then come back center uh, to take a video of themselves, and then you extract a keyframe out of the video, and that's, that's the way you do it. There's all kinds of different ways to do it. Yeah. Wait, wait, I, I, hold on, let, let him get that microphone. So the algorithm for doing this, um, you have essentially looked backwards, built a model, and you've assumed that the process is stationary, and you can use that to predict the future. My question is, how well do you think that assumption holds? Say you enter a financial crisis tomorrow, um, what, sorry, <laughs> like, I, I'm just wondering, how do you think yeah. that in your model? Um, yeah. When I first started doing this, what I did was I, I essentially built two models. I built a model for good times, and I built a, built a model for bad times. And the, the bad times model was built to track the performance of Lending Club and Prosper Assets um, from 2007 to 2009. Uh, and that gives you a good example of, okay, what's going to happen if the sky falls in, right? Now, uh, the reality is you, you really don't know, you know. Um, one of the reasons why we build dynamic models is that we want to get ahead of the market. So we build a model based upon the past, but the past includes yesterday, right? So you keep feeding data in, and you're continuously retraining. And the little blips that occur don't move the model because now you've got a large amount of data. But you start to see the trend Right? And you start to see that, hey, there's a problem brewing. One of the things that I noticed with lenders, because I, I was working with lenders during the last financial crisis, is that the bigger banks, they, they have a model. It's a fairly simplistic one. They change it twice a year. Okay. Um, the world ended in September with the collapse of Lehman Brothers from a financial perspective. Right? But they weren't scheduled to change their model until March. So the model didn't change. <laughs> and, it's, and I'm kind of like going, guys, do, do you not get that you know, everything's just broken? Um, so I wanted to build models that were adaptive to what's going on in, in the real world. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, same, same thing in mind. So uh, I have a question. So uh, to my understanding, so the more complex our models uh, tend to be more accurate. 
but that they are hard to use with single brain. Um, and the, the single brain models um, uh, tend to, you know, um, not as accurate as the complex models, but that they, well, for instance, the linear regression and the decision tree, but that they are very good at, you know, interpretability. So my question is, how would you address the, you know, the balance between the model interpretability and model accuracy? Because some, somehow I feel that the model interpretability is uh, equally on even right. Um, right. I, I think the, the repeatability and the explainability are actually more important than the accuracy, particularly in consumer lending. Um, we, we need to be able to fully explain the outcome of a model. So, for instance, in the States and now in Canada and in Europe, it's really not legal to use deep learning for credit decisioning because deep learning is inherently non-explainable. Gradient boosting, on the other hand, is quite explainable. So we focus more on uh, gradient boosting ensembles, right? What I've found, and if you look at Kaggle competitions over the past few years, you'll find that the, the overwhelming winner of competitions is, is gradient boosting. Right, and, and there's, it's really the best balance um, it, to deal with what, what you're dealing with. The, the, you, know, you, you measure um, the performance of an algorithm by looking at the AUC or the Gini score. Or, you know, you've got different methodologies for doing it. But I found that those can also be misleading because the best, al the best model isn't necessarily the one with the highest um, AUC score. A good example is that SVMs perform quite well, but SVMs are purely binary. So SVMs give you a yes or a no. They don't give you a 90% yes, they just give you yes or no. So all yeses are equal. Well, that's not terribly useful in the real world. So you have to look beyond the AUC and you have to look at you know, the, the real world outcome. You had, yes? Um, well, none of them come from the credit scores. None, none are derived. They're all raw inputs from um, a credit bureau. So what we do is we take a credit file, and in a credit file, you know, everybody looks at the credit score, right? And then they kind of put it down. They say, oh, well, we've got the information we need. Um, the real value of the credit report is not the credit score. The credit score is just a fairly simplistic algorithm, and it's not terribly predictive. Um, the real value is in the raw data, and I'll give you a really good example. Um, lenders typically look at four things from a credit file. They look at the FICO or Beacon score. They look at the debt to income ratio inclusive of the, the new loan. Um, they look at the trade line data, which is, did this person have any 30-day lates, 60-day lates, 90-day lates? They have knockouts, such as was there a bankruptcy or a lien or a judgment, right? And those aren't really factored into the model. They're just kicked out at that point, right? And the last thing they look at is inquiry count, right? So lenders have a belief that if you have more than four to six inquiries in a six-month period, you're a higher risk. What we discovered was that's not actually right. I mean, it's kind of right. But what's really predictive is the rate of increase of inquiries over time. If you build a time series out of the inquiries, you gain much more knowledge. So for instance, if you have six inquiries over six months, one per month, you have one risk profile. If you have no inquiries and you dump six of them this month, you have a really different risk profile. So, you know, you have to look beyond, um, beyond the summarized data and get into the raw data. And that's where we look at, you know, thousands of attributes. And uh, just I'll, I'll give you one other example. We, we work with a, um, a large subprime lender in the UK. And um, they had a very different problem than the lenders we generally deal with in the US because they are an auto lender. And they have completely nailed their business. They have a 3% collection, a 3% uh, repo rate and a 6% uh, collection rate in subprime auto. It's remarkably good. The problem is it took them two to three days to make a decision on a loan 
because it was being made by human underwriters. So they were able to process about 100 loan applications a day. And the business is doing great, highly profitable. Now, along came two web-based used car sites that could generate 1,000 applications a day. Well, the value of those applications was such that most of them are not very good. A lot of them are junk. And so they can't really uh, assign, they can't just hire more people to solve the problem. So they came to me and said, well, could you replicate our human process um, in an algorithm and reduce the two to three days to under a second? And so that's what we built. And it's been running for about eight months now. And we took them from 100 applications a day to 1,000 applications a day without increasing their staff. And I think that that's a transformative effect. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, you, you have to. I mean. Hmm? Yeah. How how do we determine? You know, what's often referred to as feature engineering. How how do we determine what the inputs are that we're going to look at, and how we order them and structure them? Is that? Yeah. When you're dealing with a credit report, the credit report is time-based. It tends to go back five or seven years, right? And so that's the limitation right there, right? And so, yes, you do provide some weighting that, you know, more current is more valuable than older, right? So one of the things that we do in, in the dynamic modeling is to um, give more weight to newer data that comes in than old data because there's a higher volume of old data and the new data then gets more weight, but you have to be careful not to give it too much weight or you're introducing fluctuations in, into the model. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're welcome. Um, well, we're really looking at their behavior and not their motivation. Now, it's often assumed in the market that, well, there, there are two basic motivational areas. One is the willingness to repay, right, and the other is the ability to repay. I mean, there's some people who might just have the money in the account and they don't want to pay you, right? They just want to keep it. Um, there are other people who, you know, absolutely intend to honor their obligations and they're just really bad with money, and they just are never going to have it. And, you know, these are things that you generally see in the credit file. Now, the, these are extrapolations, right? And they're approximations. They're never completely accurate. But what we tend to look at in credit modeling is, you know, the past behavior is fairly indicative. So one of the things that we look at um, in assessing somebody who either has a pretty bad credit file or no real credit file is to look at their bank account, right? So we ask them to log into their online banking. We tell them exactly what we're going to do. We get a copy of their last 90 days. And we can look and see, well, are they bouncing a lot, lot, lot of checks? Do they make more money than they spend? What's the minimum balance on their account? Um, we can make determinations that are just as good as what we would find in a credit file about the, the probability that they're going to be in a position to repay. Is that? Oh, I was also wondering, though, in particular, like, um, not just in terms of risk, but also, like, the ability to repay, like, over pay as well, right? 
o overpay in terms of, yeah. you mean paying more than they owe, or? Yeah, so like, um, sorry, what's your, uh, one of your algorithms mainly to determine whether to give out a loan or also to determine like, the amount of money that you're going to Yes, they're the same thing. Um, the, the algorithm, well, the, the, the algorithm that I wrote three and a half years ago was an auto ML algorithm to apply all different types of algorithms to the problem and then build ensembles and test them against each other and determine which one works. Then we found after, you know, about three years that uh, we were always picking the same one. Um, so we simplified that um, somewhat, but, but the, the basic methodology is you have a string of numbers and you have an outcome and you train a model to correlate the outcome to the string of numbers. The model doesn't care what it is that you are predicting, right? They're just numbers, right? So we're predicting the probability, and you can think of the probability as the confidence score of the algorithm. Um, we're simply predicting uh, whatever dependent variable someone thinks is important. So it could be default. It could be profit. It could be conversion. What is the likelihood that this person, if offered a loan, will take one? Uh, and it can be profit. Uh, in terms of we can take the historical view and say, OK, this loan generated a $100 profit. This loan generated a $50 profit. And then correlate. And so when we get a new application come in, we can go, ah, this one's likely to generate $100. Now, the way that we deal with pricing is simply based upon probability. So if, you know, what we're doing is saying the probability that this loan will be profitable is X. If X is higher than Y, then X gets a better rate. It's, and it can be as granular as you want. We deal with floating point numbers. Um, so we don't really have, I mean, we generally use three significant digits, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, we can use six. Uh, and you can develop as many tiers as you want. Okay, you're welcome. How many more questions do we have? A couple? Okay, maybe we'll take three more questions, and, uh, and then we'll move along. Okay. We do need to be out here uh, mostly on time. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if, if you want to just keep asking. And I, I mean, I'm... I'll stay. My, my, yeah, my, my, my flight is uh, tomorrow at uh, 9.55, <laughs> so... I, <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, uh, lending is heavily regulated, and, and you have to be very careful about using anything like demographic data or macroeconomic data. For instance, in, in our models, we exclude first name and last name, because names are indicative of race, indicative of gender, indicative of, of ethnicity. We exclude birthdays, obviously. Um, we exclude zip codes because in the U.S. and, and I'm sure in, in Canada as well, a zip code or a postal code gives you is a proxy for race. It's illegal to do to use those things in in most advanced uh, uh, cultures. So um, we're very aware that you know just because something may be predictive doesn't mean that it's legal or ethical to use. Um, one of the things a lot of people have looked at is social media data, right? And so there are people who have worked about, well, um, I know Joe, and Joe's a crook, therefore I'm less trustworthy, right? I mean, you look at the social graph of a person. But, or, you know, conversely, that, oh, I know a bunch of really honest, wealthy people, so I can repay my loan. Well, it, that's ridiculous. I mean, when I look at my linkages on a social network, 
would I loan most of them money? No. <laughs> I mean, they're just people who connected, you know? So um, social media data is, has not proven valuable. We did a study in, um, in Kenya that was really interesting and in that the lender had the Facebook graph of all their applicants. And they were absolutely sure that the count of friends would be predictive of outcome. What we found was actually it is. If they have no friends, they're probably not a real person. <laughs> or they're locked in their home and they're not going to pay you. Um, if they had one or more friends, they were real. And there's no difference between having one friend and 500 friends in the likelihood that you're going to repay, right? So, yeah, it has some value in fraud mitigation. It has no value in lending. Also, I certainly would not want to explain to a regulator that I denied someone for a loan because they know some shady people. <laughs> Somebody over here? Had, yeah. Yeah, um, interestingly enough that you, you bring that up, um, we're working on recording our loans in an Ethereum uh, blockchain. And the, the value of it, and it really has nothing to do with AI, it's, it's really just a matter of being able to record things in a ledger that is permanent and immutable and everybody can see it. You know, we want to put the loan data out there so that the, uh, the, the uh, consumer, the borrower can see it, the regulator can see it, the investors can see it, everybody has access to it and we can control it. And that's what blockchain does. So we will use it for that purpose. Blockchain and AI, it's, um, it's got a lot of problems at this point. I mean, you, if you know how Ethereum works, um, it updates essentially, everything's got uh, a delay, right? So you run an update across the network. And so it's extraordinarily slow in terms of the kind of processing that we do. Um, there's no way that we can do the kind of stuff that we're doing in a blockchain as a distributed application. So you have to kind of pick the purpose of it. But I think as a, as a ledger, it's terrific. Yes, sir. Um, I actually, I mean, I built a number of models from that Lending Club data set. Um, the issue with Kaggle is that, um, how to put this um, kindly, um, the, the model with Kaggle is that you find a bunch of really smart people around the world to form teams and solve problems, and they get a prize, okay? Um, I'm in the business of solving these problems for a fee, <laughs> not a prize. So um, the problem with Kaggle is that Kaggle owns the competition, owns the work product, which now means that Google owns the work product, and I don't work for Google. So, um, so but, but yes, it is very interesting to do the competitions and see how you score. But I will say that we have some tools right now that out of the box um, will win a Kaggle competition. Um, you can take H2O, for instance, and you can win a Kaggle competition with maybe putting another day's work in optimizing the, the uh, algorithm that it produced. So, yeah. So, Chris, challenge accepted? <laughs> Is that it? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll be really honest, at this point, it's, it's really not very important. The goal is to capture an understanding of why people need to borrow money and then later on see how it correlates. Um, <clears throat> we, we actually get really good information there. You know, we, we had a woman who explained that, um, you know, she's 
she um, sprained her ankle and she wasn't able to work for two weeks and she lives paycheck to paycheck. And her boyfriend was covering her expenses, but the rent was due and there just wasn't enough money to go around and she had another week uh, before she could go back to work, but she'd lined up an additional job. And so here's somebody who on the surface looks like a really poor candidate um, but when you get some more information about them, you realize, well, no, they're not a poor candidate at all. There's someone who's worth taking a risk on. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll take the information that, that people put in, and then eventually we'll have enough of that information, and we'll run some algorithms against it. We'll do sentiment analysis and topic extraction, and then we'll, we'll have a kind of a machine version understanding and we'll be able to determine uh, what are the, you know, what are good reasons for borrowing money from the standpoint of repayment. You're, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, we look at two things. So we look at credit files and bank accounts, right? So in the absence of a credit file, we can look at a bank account. In the absence of a bank account, we can look at a credit card. In the absence of anything, we're not really set up to do um, a face-to-face -face analysis. Um, we're not loaning enough money, and we don't have the staff. Now, I work with lenders like in, in Latin America, particularly in Mexico, um, where that's a very common situation. You know, somebody comes into a store, and they want to buy a refrigerator, and um, they don't have a bank account, and they certainly don't have a credit file. Um, and what the lender does is it goes, they go to their house, and they interview the people, and they look at the house where the refrigerator is going to go, and they look at what they do for a living, and they go to work with them, and they make a determination. Um, and that's, you know, in a lot of the third world, that's the way it works. Um, but in Canada, um, Canada is a very heavily banked population, more so than the U.S. You know, pretty much everybody's got a bank account. Um, they may not have a credit card, they may not have a credit file, but you know, people here um, tend to have bank accounts. All right. Um, we have um, some interest on the part of an investor to put up um, the seed money. Um, to do, um, what we can do is we need about 1.4 million to do an initial investigation and that will qualify us um, for a, uh, a Department of Health um, uh, grant. And so we could you know, then get a phase one and phase two grants and that would carry us to a point where um, we could probably get something to market. So it's, right now I've been focusing on lending, but I'm, I'm hoping to uh, get back to the, uh, to the cancer genomics stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so all right, thank you all very much.